Good afternoon. I'm honored to introduce our next speaker, University of Michigan faculty member and former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, Barbara McQuaid. Professor McQuaid's leadership and service in this region have been recognized uh, in Detroit and statewide. She is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Detroit Free Press Neil Shine Award for Exemplary Regional Leadership, and I had the pleasure of being there to see her receive that, uh, and the Frank J. Kelly Distinguished Public Service Award from the State Bar of Michigan. In 2017, she joined the University of Michigan Law School as a professor from practice. She is also a legal contributor for NBC News and for MSNBC. Professor McQuaid has committed her entire career to the state of Michigan and to the city of Detroit. She has sought to make Detroit a safer and more just place by fighting public corruption, terrorism, civil rights violations, and other crimes. Her dedication to making Detroit the best community it can be is truly inspiring. And we are honored to have, here, uh, have her here today. Please join me in welcoming Barbara McQuaid. Well, thank you so much, Dean, for that kind introduction. And thanks to all of you brave souls who are still here. Bravo. Thank you for, for staying. Um, I want to thank uh, Janelle Simmons and Alicia Davis for inviting me to speak here. When I heard that there was a combination between the two things I love most in this world, the University of Michigan and the city of Detroit, I said, my god, I'm in. <laughs> the only thing better would be if uh, a Detroit Tigers game would break out in the middle of the room or something. But. <laughs> Um, so I'm so excited um, to be here. These really are uh, uh, my, my two passions, and what a wonderful opportunity to have a chance to bring them together. During my career um, as a lawyer, I worked in Detroit for 26 years, and so I saw the good times and the bad times. I saw improvements in fits and starts, and I will tell you, this one feels different. It really feels like Detroit has some momentum and has turned the corner, and it's uh, a really exciting moment and exciting opportunities. And I, I don't like to use the phrase, Detroit's coming back, because it suggests this backward-looking thing of nostalgia and going back to the good old days. And frankly, the good old days were not so good for everyone. I instead love to think of it as a future Detroit, a different Detroit, creating something new that's a really exciting place that's inclusive for everybody and has opportunities for everybody. Uh, Uh, but I, I do believe that as goes Detroit, so goes the state of Michigan, and so goes the University of Michigan. So I think we all have a stake in seeing Detroit succeed. There's a lot of important work to be done. And so much promise in Detroit right now. I have seen a city on the rise. There is this absolute economic rebound with you know, new restaurants opening every day, more workers every day. My husband still commutes to Detroit every day. And he says, this traffic is out of control. And we say, what a great problem to have. There are so many people who are living and working in Detroit. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and as we have heard many times today, uh, Detroit is a city of resilience. Detroit is a city of fighters. It's a wonderful community, and I loved every minute that I spent working with Detroiters in neighborhoods. Um, and in fact, my Twitter logo is of the Joe Louis fist, because I love that symbol of Detroit's fighting spirit and resilience. We get knocked down, but we always get back up and keep on fighting. Um, but Detroit is also a place with a lot of challenges. And um, when you spend time in Detroit public schools and in Detroit's neighborhoods, there is a sense of frustration and sadness. Um, there are children left behind. There are schools that are not what we would expect or should expect. There is uh, a literacy rate that is too high, a crime rate that is too high, an employment rate that is too low. And so there's a lot of 
challenge that remains to be done. But uh, where there's challenge, there's opportunity. And what a great opportunity for all of us, an opportunity to work in so many different places in Detroit to try to serve. And what an opportunity for our three campuses to come together. We surround Detroit. We've got Flint and Dearborn and Ann Arbor and this incredible laboratory for learning just a few miles away down the street. And so uh, a chance for the university to learn and contribute, a chance for the city to partner and engage and benefit from all of the great talent um, that we have. And thank you to everyone in this room, to all the stories that we've heard today of people who are sharing their talents with the city of Detroit and their time with the city of Detroit. We appreciate it so much. In my work as US attorney, I had a chance to uh, partner with communities in Detroit to try to uh, improve just outcomes for people living in Detroit. And I thought I would share with you some of what I learned in that experience. And if there's really one uh, message to take away from this is that you can be successful in your work, whatever it is, if you do that work with respect. You have to respect all who are doing the work. You have to respect the city. You have to respect the community you're working with and respect the work itself. And if you can have that respect, and remember that is the, the big issue, then um, if you forget everything else I said today, then you will be on the path to success. But I'll try to tell you a little bit about, um, about the work I did and some lessons that I learned in the work that I was doing in Detroit. Um, two programs that I worked on in particular I'll talk about. One was the Youth Violence Prevention Initiative, and another was Ceasefire Detroit. Um, and I'll discuss both of those programs to give you some context uh, for some lessons learned. So first, the Youth Violence Prevention Initiative. This was an initiative pushed out by the White House during the Obama administration. And they asked to partner with a number of cities around the country that had uh, startling crime statistics, particularly as it related to young people, for crime committed by young people and against young people. And so the city of Detroit agreed to partner with this program. And so the US attorneys were tasked with trying to facilitate this effort in all of the cities that were partnering in this program around the country. And so our partners were the city of Detroit, Detroit, Detroit Public Schools, social service agencies, law enforcement, and a number of other stakeholders. And our goal was to reduce violence against young people and by young people. And so we put together a collaborative effort that resulted in safe routes to school, school safety stations, peer mentoring, and alternatives to expulsion. And so all of those were uh, high aspirations and high goals that uh, were in many ways uh, achieved. The other project was one called Ceasefire Detroit, a program designed to reduce gun violence by members of street gangs. If you look at the statistics and what drives violence in Detroit, there are really three big drivers. One is drug trafficking, another is violent street gangs, and the other is domestic violence. And so the thought is, if we could speak to these kids who are in street gangs and talk with them about the dangers of gun violence, maybe we can reach out and impact some of them. And so once again, we had a number of partners, federal, state, and local law enforcement, the faith community, social services organizations, and a research partner that helped us to identify the people who had some brush with the criminal justice system um, and involvement with a group or gang and who might be receptive to the message. We would have quarterly call-ins where we would call in about 30 members of gangs and talk with them. And the message had three parts. One was the message from law enforcement, my part, which was providing them with good information about the consequences of additional criminal activity. Many people get charged in the federal system and don't realize the enormous sentences that they can face for drug trafficking or using guns in commission of crimes of violence. And so we would share with them stories of real people that came out of their neighborhoods that they often knew and the kind of time that they were facing in federal court. And you would see jaws drop on the ground. But we told them that we're telling you this because we respect your intelligence and that we hope that if you have this good information, you will make good decisions with it. The second component was the uh, service providers who would talk about services that were available to these young men um, if they wanted to avail themselves of them. They were given a card with one phone number that they could call to ask for help and they could get help with felon-friendly uh, employers, help with resume writing, uh, job interviewing skills, drug treatment, drug counseling, payment for uh, child daycare, um, all, tattoo removal, all kinds of services 
available for people who wanted to get out of gang life. And then the final part of the program was what we called the moral voice of the community. It was often the mother of a murder victim who would talk about the very real and painful consequences of gun violence in the community. This was often the most powerful moment of the evening. And sometimes members of the gang would get up and hug the mother after hearing her story of loss of you know a child or a, a young person who was gunned down um, through uh, the crossfire of a gang war. And so that was really moving. And then we would sit down and eat with them, you know, break bread and talk with them about their story and about uh, you know, the fact that they're a real person and we care about them and we're all in this together. And as a result of that program, at least in part, perhaps other factors at work as well, we saw in the regions where we were doing this work a uh, reduction in gun violence by 49%. And so something was working. We were getting through to some of these people. Um, so how, uh, how do you succeed when you're working on these programs? Um, in part, it's because you have a great program and the substance of your program will succeed in solving a problem. But I also think that process is very important and it's important to think through how you go about trying to solve certain problems or improve certain situations um, in the community. And I most certainly don't pretend to have all the answers. There is much I uh, can learn and much I've learned today by listening to some of the presenters. But I do have a few thoughts about th some of the things I learned by watching the process unfold in Detroit with these two programs, Youth Violence Prevention Initiative and Ceasefire Detroit. And I've got sort of three lessons, three takeaways that I'll share with you that I learned from this work. Um, one, the first thing you have to do is ask people what they need before you come in and give them what you think they need. Um, and that's so important, you know, too often people from the outside, very well intentioned, who've done a lot of research, think we know what is best, but you need to ask people what they want and what they're ready for uh, before uh, I think you can be effective. And I saw that um, when we were doing the work in the Youth Violence Prevention Initiative. Um, in that work, um, the many of the uh, subject matter experts in that work were from Washington, D.C., working for federal agencies, but many of them were um, uh, from academia. And when they came in to roll out the, um, the program, the first thing that they said we needed to do was to have a series of listening sessions. And I remember thinking that this was going to take an awful lot of time to, um, to have listening sessions. And they set aside a day each for each of these groups to have listening sessions and also encouraged follow-up. But we had a day-long roundtable with law enforcement. We had another day-long session with members of the faith community. We had another discussion with education leaders from schools. We sat down with nonprofit service providers. I know Derek Blackman, who was from Black Family Development here today, was participated in some of those roundtables. We had another with business leaders. And the most important one that I probably wouldn't have thought of was sitting down with the young people themselves students, teens, uh, young people who are in school, who made some of the best partners, some of the best comments, and some of the best uh, input that we received. And we learned so many things from them that helped shape the program that eventually emerged from this. And I think that some of these things never would have come to pass if we hadn't listened to these stakeholders. Um, and one of them, the students themselves, that we ended up implementing was safe routes to school. I don't think any of us would have thought of this if we hadn't been listening to the students themselves, but they said the biggest obstacle for them is feeling unsafe going to and from school. They um, have to walk great distances. There are no school buses in the Detroit public schools, a fact many people did not know when they began this work. And so to the extent kids ride buses, they ride city buses, but many of them walk to school. And because many schools have been closed throughout the city of Detroit, as enrollment has decreased over the decades, many of these young people will have to walk a very long distance to get to school. And because of the weather and because of the, the time of day that school starts, many of these kids are walking to school in the dark, in the cold, for long distances in a city with a very high crime rate. And so they talked about, well, what would it take to help you feel safe to school? And they came up with the idea of having safe routes to school, uh, figuring out what's the best route. They understood that we didn't have the resources to patrol every route. And so they said, let's come up with some common routes that kids can get to. And they would paint footprints on the routes that were the preferred routes for kids to take to school so they would know which route. And on those routes, they would devote volunteer time to removing um, 
uh, hedges, trimming hedges where people could be hiding, to uh, improving the lighting on those streets so that they could see on their way to school, be well lighted, uh, to boarding up abandoned houses that were along that route that kids felt unsafe walking past because they heard stories of what went on in some of those houses and to en enlisting a volunteer crew that would do volunteer patrols, adults with a light on their car and a vest that said that they were part of the Safe Routes to School volunteer patrol with CB radios, driving around um, on, the, on the routes and patrolling the routes. And with this, the kids felt safer. And when they felt safer, they actually showed up to school. And when they showed up to school, they learned something. And so this was an idea that the kids themselves came up with and was only able to be implemented because the group thought to ask the students, and the students came up with that suggestion. So before you go off heading in the wrong direction and thinking that you might know what's best and what's needed in a community, so important to spend time in the community asking questions to help understand the lay of the land, what is wanted, what is needed at that time. Um, so that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is the importance of using plain English. Um, you know, we in all of our different fields in academia have our jargon, we have our lexicon, uh, we all use it, and in fact, once you become enmeshed in that world, you don't even realize it. You don't even hear the acronyms anymore because you are so accustomed to using them. We certainly had them at the Department of Justice, and now that I am in academia, I hear it all the time when people talk about their pedagogical theories and their doctrinal courses. Um, you know, it's very normal in academia, but if you don't, if you use it in the real world, normal people don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so it's really important to get away from that. And we saw this a little bit with the Youth Violence Prevention Initiative because, as I said, many of the people leading this initiative worked at federal agencies and government but had come from academia. And they would use the kinds of words that you might see in a journal abstract. I, I like to write them down because I always found them interesting. So here are the few that I wrote down during the time they came in. Uh, one was capacity building. I know that's very common for people working in social services, but real people don't know what that is, and it sounds um, very uh, jargon-like. Vis-a-vis, what the heck is that? Paradigm, milieu, uh, full stop. Full stop, that's from you know telegram days or something. Full stop, what is that? that's a you know British full period or something, but full stop. Pe normal people don't talk about that. Normative and positive, I still don't know which is which. Um, and my favorite of all, gestalt. Maybe a little better than synergy, but please don't use these words. Um, and you know, there's a real reason. I, I, I laugh about it a little bit, but if the point of communication is to be understood, and if you're using big fancy words, you're not gonna be understood. And you might even be received with hostility, that you are perceived as other, you are perceived as pretentious, or you are perceived as trying to be better than others. And so I warn you about this, and you might think when you think about your language and you think about prepared remarks, you know, going through um, and thinking about uh, what is the right way to uh, frame things so that you can be understood. And by the way, I've been here all day. I consider myself a little bit of the jargon police, and I've been listening to a lot of these lightning talks, and you're all doing very well, because I would have called you out immediately if you had used your uh, academic language. But really important, communicate to be understood. So that's lesson number two. And then finally, lesson number three, the importance of including the community in the work. You can't just helicopter in and show up and say, um, you know, we're here from Washington and we're here to help. You have to include people in the work, engage them in the work, if you want them to be invested in it and have a stake in it and work to be successful. And by the way, people living in the community often have really valuable abilities, talents, insights, connections, networks that can make the work far more successful. In our ceasefire work, we engage members of the community to participate in this gang intervention strategy, and it was such a great move. It worked so much. We had members on the steering committee who were from the community, people who were social service providers and faith leaders, local cops on the street, educators who could sit at the table and talk with us about what was needed and how best to connect with gang members on the street. We also hired former gang members, people with felony convictions, to be the outreach workers who worked with these folks on the street. Who has more credibility to say, you can turn your life around than someone who's already done it? Somebody who said, I used to run with the gangs, 
I, I did time for using a gun and selling drugs, and I've now seen the error of my ways. And guess what? I've turned it around. I'm a successful business person. I have a job. You can do it too. And so com bringing the people in, working shoulder to shoulder with people in the community is so important to being successful. You know, there's an old adage that says something like, um, if you want to go faster, go alone. But if you want to go farther, go together. It may take time to enlist people who are not experts in this field to do the work with you, but if you do, you will certainly be far more successful if you engage people in the work. And so if you are interested in a public health initiative in Detroit, you can hire Detroiters to work with you as healthcare professionals, as administrative support staff, whatever tasks you need, you can find people in Detroit to hire into that work to help you to be successful. If your goal is to improve education in Detroit, um, you can bring on K through 12 students, you can bring on teachers from Detroit, you can bring on educational administrators to help with that, uh, help you understand the target population that you want to serve. So it's not enough to just serve a community. You have to engage the community and partner with the community. And not as mem people who are beneath you performing tasks, but as full partners providing input into the work. Really important. So those are just a few of the tips from my work in Detroit. Um, and uh, it's important to think strategically, but as I said, if you can think with respect and have respect permeate everything that you do, then you can be successful. Um, if we listen, if we communicate, if we partner with members of the community, then I am confident that we have people in this room who will redevelop neighborhoods in Detroit. And there are people in this room who will reform education in Detroit. There are people in this room who will spark new businesses and services in Detroit. There are people in this room who will improve literacy in Detroit. All of those things we have the power to do if we do it with respect. And as a great Detroiter once said, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Aretha Franklin, do it with respect and you will succeed. Thank you so much for all that you're doing to improve the quality of life in Detroit. I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, if you've been jotting down your questions, you can send them forward. We have volunteers to collect your questions so I can go through them in turn. I'm going to seize the moment and ask a question right now, if I may. Um, I, I was wondering if, what perspective you have on the way federal policy and resources can have an impact locally and the extent to which the university and the city uh, can influence how those things are shaped and the way those resources can flow here. Yeah, so both of those programs I mentioned, Youth Violence Prevention Initiative and Ceasefire Detroit, came from federal grants. So many uh, federal departments offer grant funding, and the ability to write a good grant application is often elusive. And so partnering with people in the city of Detroit to help them write a good grant application, there's a lot of need, but having uh, a fiduciary partner is really important. People uh, like... like uh, uh, Tanya Allen at the Skillman Foundation often serve as the fiduciary partner on some of these grants. But finding an appropriate fiduciary partner and the ability to write a good grant application is a need that often exists in Detroit. But they are so eligible for dollars and there's such compelling stories to be told and such great grant opportunities that I would love to promote that because a lot of good can be done with those opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Here we go. Great. I was quickly trying to think of another question while I was waiting for a question. So. Um, if you could grant your successor as U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan three wishes, what would they be? I like this. Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, cr complete absence of crime so that he could spend all his time on um, improvement activities, you know, and reinvesting in the community would be one. Um, that's for sure. Um, I would say... Uh, the gift of additional resources, um, always not enough prosecutors to address the most serious problems. Um, I would say um, the opportunity to work on crime prevention, that was some of the favorite work that I did, uh, but again, we often lack the resources to do it, and prevention was so important to the work uh, that we did. And then um, an opportunity to use the resources of the office to help educate the public. Um, there are a lot of great things that uh, prosecutors can do by reaching out to schools, to talk to kids about careers in justice, 
um, internet safety, crime prevention strategies, and so many kinds of things. So it, it really all probably comes down to one common theme, which is um, absence of crime, presence of resources to be able to do positive work. Thank you. Any other slips of paper coming my way? Well, then we'll just open it to the floor. Please raise your hand if you have a question. There we are. <laughs> President Schlissel. So, Barb, you know, uh, we have such high rates of incarceration in certain subpopulations in our society. And your office, when you were the US attorney, obviously played a role in that. How do you think about the incarceration challenge the United States faces? And what do you wish you could have done from your position if you had that level of authority? Uh, the question from President Schlissel was about uh, the challenge of mass incarceration in America and what do I wish we could have done at the U.S. Attorney's Office to try to address that problem. There was a, a strategy that Attorney General Eric Holder implemented in an effort to reduce mass incarceration in America and um, in 2013, which was um, directing prosecutors to be much more selective in charging crimes that carry mandatory minimum sentences. There are certain drug offenses that based on the amount and whether the person has a prior criminal conviction that can result in um, anywhere from a mandatory minimum of five years to life, depending on the quantity and the, the criminal record. Um, and you can sometimes get situations where members of a criminal conspiracy are all accountable for that same amount. Um, and, and perhaps it is an appropriate sentence for defendants one and two who are the kingpins and leader, leaders of a drug trafficking organization who are bringing in you know, kilograms and kilograms of, of illegal drugs into a community. But also farther down on that org chart are people who are couriers um, and street corner dealers. And they can sometimes be held accountable for the full amount of those drugs. And so what we end up with is uh, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of defendants doing massive amounts of prison time for drug trafficking offenses. What Attorney General Holder told us was that we should presume, the presumption should be that you would not charge uh, a mandatory minimum uh, charge that carries a mandatory minimum sentence unless certain factors were present, violence, firearms, uh, substantial criminal history, or connections with a cartel or gang. And so as a result of that, we did see a substantial reduction in people who were being sent to prison for a long time. And there was also a clemency initiative to try to release people who had previously been sentenced under the prior regime. Um, sadly, that has changed in the new administration, although um, the new administration does permit discretion for prosecutors to uh, be more selective in the use of that. And so I think time will tell whether the shift has really changed or not, because I think even conservatives favor reducing the prison population from a cost perspective. Every year we spend more and more on prisons and less and less on new crime control initiatives like the opioid epidemic. And so I think most people recognize that we need to do something. Even the state of Texas has uh, worked on criminal justice reform to try to reduce the prison population so that we can free those funds to use it for other things. And so I have some hope that we may see some moves in that direction, um, even in the current administration. Thank you very much. I've just been given a little bit of notice about the time. So All right. um, at this point, I'd like to invite uh, President Schlissel back to the stage. And thank, thank you very much, Dr. Patel. Thank you.